Well, hello and welcome to NBCF at Home. It's great to have you with us. We're continuing on in our series today, Making Room for God, which is all about how do we reorientate our lives in such a way that God can move. And this week we're talking about something which is a little bit countercultural. Like last week, we're talking about rest. What role does rest play in making room for God in our lives? So stick around for that in just a minute. Let me just introduce ourselves. If you're new to us, my name's Neil. Together with my wife, Jo, we lead North Berwick Christian Fellowship. We're a church here that meets in North Berwick in East Lothian, and uh, you'd be very welcome to join us on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. at North Berwick High School. Or of course, you can catch up later on our YouTube channel from 7 p.m. on Sundays, which is what you're watching now. Um, We are looking to build a community of followers of Jesus. So if you are either already following uh, Jesus and looking for a church in our area, then we're grateful to have you along. If you are just exploring who is Jesus, what does Christianity believe, what does church even mean and look like in this culture, in this society, uh, then you're very welcome to come and check us out. Um, We invite people to um, say hello, to uh, get in touch on email, to leave us a comment below on our videos. Uh, And if you enjoy the content, then please do remember to like and subscribe as well. It's great to have you with us today. We're going to join now with our teaching. But before we do, let me just pray for us as we go into uh, God's word for us for today. God, I thank you that you are always speaking, that you are with us. And as we look at this topic of rest, I pray you'd speak to us as individuals and help us to be the kind of people who make room for you in our lives. We we bless you, Father, and uh, thank you for your work in our lives. Amen. Let's join now with our teaching. How do we make room for God in our lives? We live in a culture that's fast moving away from a Christian worldview that used to dominate our country and most of the Western world. Christianity has lost its place of dominance in our society. Churches are often smaller and many of the mainline denominations in our country and elsewhere are struggling to know how to adapt to the pace of change of our culture. So what kind of church do we need to be in these times? I think that's a really important question that we can have to, have to wrestle with. But I think there's an even more important question that we need to ask, and it's simply this, what kind of disciple do I need to be in this time? I want to spend uh, just a few weeks as we began last week looking at this idea of how do we make room for God in our lives, precisely because our culture is trying to squeeze God out. And none of us are immune to the impact of that. So in response, rather than us getting anxious about the state of our culture, our response has to be to live differently. Adding anxiety to an already anxious system is not a good way to go. Sometimes we need to recognize where the current is pulling people and swim upstream. The early church stood out like a sore thumb because it was so different and they lived life in a way that was very different. Their lives looked very different to the people next to them. And if we're not careful in our culture, followers of Jesus look a lot like everyone else except they hold these private beliefs about God. The goal, of course, is not that we just become these different people for the sake of being different people. The goal is that we take Jesus' teachings and we apply it genuinely and authentically to our culture today. The secular dream, the dream of God, a godless society, is to have the kingdom without the king, to live spiritual lives without the spirit, to use technology to make ourselves God to insulate ourselves with comfort so that we never feel pain or discomfort. A lot of effort goes into our culture into redefining what life looks like without God. So in a world that's seeking to squeeze God out, how do we make room for God? 
We began obviously last week, um, and the idea of making room for God sounds like this like super spiritual thing. I need to go away and become a monk, or I need to go and do something radical with my life. But actually, as we saw last week, making room for God just begins with the simple decisions that we're making every day and every week to make space for him. So last week, I, I shared about the importance of slowing down. God is not in the fast lane. He's not racing around. And he encourages us to live slower lives. A slow pace enables us to walk with God, to hear his voice, to linger with people, to live freer and lighter. To slow down means to reorganize our time, to be intentional with the things we say yes to and the things we say no to. Now, there's always going to be things in seasons of life we have no control over, perhaps jobs or children, um, although we often have more control in our lives than we like to give ourselves credit for. So the first thing I brought to us was this idea of making room for God involves slowing down. And today I was going to go off in a slightly different direction, but I I sensed just after last week that there was a missing piece that's related that we need to look at. So today we're going to talk about rest. Everyone just goes, ah. We're going to return to these verses that we read uh, last week from Jesus, uh, paraphrased in the message translation. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Now, rest is a strange topic because it can feel a little bit self-indulgent, can't it? We're going to talk about rest. Am I just giving in to the culture's voice that says that we should just uh, live our best lives, have as many holidays abroad as possible, sipping cocktails on the beach, Uh, retire as early as possible so we can do absolutely nothing. Well, it turns out that rest is a much more revolutionary idea than that. Rest is, of course, one of the things that Jesus promises us as we read in those verses. And it was was St. Augustine that famously said that our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Talking about God. Our hearts are restless until we find rest in you. So there is a restlessness in our culture and sometimes, if we're honest, in us. But Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. He didn't mean by rest a life free from trouble. He didn't mean a life free from work. After all, God has good works prepared for us. So what did he mean? Well, This rest that Jesus offers us is firstly about a kind of inner calm, a freedom from striving. It's related to some of the identity messages we were looking at in the last series. Um, We no longer have to strive to be something because of what Jesus has done. We can rest in the Father's love for us. We can stop playing the world's games. We can let go of vain ambition. We sung about that just a moment ago. And the needs to achieve or find love or approval from the people around us. And all of that makes us weary and restless. Sometimes we're tired not because we've been exerting ourselves, but because we've lost sight of the rest that Jesus came to bring each of us. He comes and he lifts a heavy blanket that's been over us. He wants us to live free and light No more burden, condemnation, guilt, all the heavy things that we carry around with us. Our identity is secure as children of God, living from a place of rest. So one of the ways that we make room for God is by living at rest. That is to receive the calm and the peace that Jesus wants to give us in our lives. To find contentment. Contentment with who we are and contentment with God. It is only when we're free from the expectations of others, the approval of others, and the need to keep achieving that we can find this rest. 
I want to just take a moment and just, just pray for that right now. Maybe you're listening to this going, oh, that sounds so good. <laughs> Please, can I have that rest? I just want to pray for that now. Jesus, I just pray for your peace to come upon us. We pray that you would show us where our hearts are restless so that you can pour in your peace. Where our minds are racing that you would still our thoughts. Where the opinions of others are are shaping us and pushing us around in a storm, I pray, Father, that you'd give us that inner peace, that rest. Make it a reality in our lives. Amen. It's okay if you fall asleep, it's okay. We're talking about rest, so if anyone falls asleep, it's like this is the sermon to do it in, okay? So we have, through Jesus, we have this inner peace, this inner calm that comes to bring us. But this idea of making room for God means living from that calm, but it means more than that. Because you can claim to have an inner peace but still be running around a hundred miles an hour. In order to live a life of rest actually means changing our calendars, reordering our priorities. And this is where this idea of a pattern or a rhythm of rest comes into our lives. As I said last week, the things that we put on our calendar are the things that are shaping us over time. The things you do weekly are the things that are shaping the kind of person you're becoming. So where is rest on our calendar? Now, I want to stop and and take a little time to look into the the, the Hebrew idea of Sabbath. Some of you will have heard of this. It's from, uh, we say Sabbath, the Hebrew word is Shabbat, and it's, 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 it's the term that's used throughout the Bible. And it's a Hebrew word, and it just simply means to stop or cease, or to be complete. And to find the root of this concept, we have to actually look back all the way to the creation narrative. So we're going to put these verses on the screen. Genesis 2, verse 2. We know, of course, God creates the world in six days, and then we come to this. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work that he had done. Now this is such a radical thought. God rested. God rested. The one who created the whole universe down tools for a day and rested. Now, this wasn't because, you know, God doesn't get tired. He doesn't run out of energy. He wasn't burnt out or struggling with anxiety. He hadn't overdone it in the first six days. He wasn't desperate for that holiday in Spain. But God rested. He rested. He works for six days and he rests on the seventh. God works, so we work. God rests, so we rest. In biblical thought, the the idea of work and rest are not opposites. They're not things that kind of fight against each other. They're simply kind of partners in a rhythm, working and resting. And interestingly, when in the creation narrative are, are humans made, when does God make us in his image? It's on the sixth day. So what do we spend the first day doing? Resting. We are created into rest. There's another, a number of other interesting things to point out from this, this idea of the seventh day. The first is that, that God blesses a day. If you read through the creation narrative, um, there's three blessings that are given. The first, he blesses the living creatures to multiply and grow and fill the earth. The second, he, he blesses uh, humans, he blesses us to go and be fruitful and multiply. And the third blessing is a day. What does that mean? Well, the first two blessings are all about reproducing and bringing life to the earth. And that means that what we can imply here is that the seventh day is also about producing life. The seventh day has the power to produce life. Now, rest is about refueling, re-energizing, bringing to life, fresh vision, fresh strength, new clarity, renewed purpose. The seventh day is life 
giving. It also says the day is called holy. Now, holy is this big word throughout scriptures. It means sacred or separate or set apart or far above. We, of course, know that God is holy. That's how we're, we're, we come to know this idea of holy. God is holy. So we normally associate God with being holy. But the very first thing in the Bible to ever be called holy is the seventh day. The first thing to be called holy in the Bible is not God, it's a day. Now this was a really radical thought for the culture around Israel and because every other culture around them was obsessed with making holy places. Places that you enter in, that's where they're holy. Holy spots, temples, sacred shrines. The whole world was about making holy places. But God here makes a holy time. The seventh day was then later, as you read on in the story, becomes a pattern for the nation of Israel. And we read it, of course, in the Ten Commandments given to Moses. We're going to look at this commandment now on the screen. It's the longest and most in-depth out of all the commandments. And it says this in Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your sons or daughters, nor your male or female servants, nor your animals, nor any foreigners residing in your towns. It's like he's kind of closed all the loopholes here. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. So the Sabbath then becomes a day for Israel. Israel, um, it's a day of blessing, a day with life-giving properties, if you like, a day set apart where God resides. For six days, they wrestle with time and the to-do lists and all of that, and then on one day, they slow down and they find and meet God in time. Sabbath was, of course, practiced by Jesus as a practicing Jew, and we're aware that Often in the stories, Jesus gets himself in trouble for the things that he does on the Sabbath. Now, this wasn't because Jesus was um, undoing the Sabbath through his ministry. He was actually dealing with the religious interpretation of the idea of Sabbath. He famously said this, again, we'll put it on the screen. um, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What he's trying to say here is that the Sabbath was supposed to be this life-giving thing that brought life to humanity, not something to constrain the the life-giving things we do, which is why he heals on the Sabbath. He does all these good things on the Sabbath because the Sabbath is about bringing people to life. It's not to constrain us or prevent uh, us from doing good things. The Sabbath is still practiced, of course, by Jews today. And for Jews, it begins on sundown at Friday, uh, or 20 minutes before sundown, I think it is, and ends at sundown on Saturday. They normally rush around on a Friday. They prepare a meal. They tidy the house. They do all the things that they've got to do on a Friday so that on Sabbath, they can rest. And during Sabbath, there are certain things that they're not allowed to do, all all forms of work, which is why that big long list is like, you can't get someone else to do the work for you. You can't do the work yourself. You can't get your animals to do the work. It's rest. But Sabbath is not the same as what we in our culture today would call a day off, which is usually the time where we do all the work that we haven't actually been paid for and then go shopping. The goal of Sabbath was twofold. The goal of Sabbath was to worship and to delight. The Sabbath was seen as worship to God in the same way that our work, the things we do with our hands, the things we create, are worship to God. In the same way, rest is actually worship. Again, that's such a counter-cultural idea. Rest is worship. You can worship God through resting. Your nap can be worship to God. It's good news. The Sabbath was also supposed to be a time of delight, enjoying good food together with good company. It's a time to reflect on all the work that's been done and go, like in the same way God does on the seventh day, he looks back on all that he's created and enjoys it. 
It's a time to give thanks and to be fully satisfied with our lot. It's supposed to be a little bit of heaven each and every week. Like the seventh day, a celebration of all that is alive. It's not supposed to be a forced time without fun or laughter, but rather a celebration. So the question you're probably all asking is, what does this mean for us today? We're not Jews. I'm assuming most of you are not Jews. Well, there's, there's much debate had amongst Christians around this idea of Sabbath, uh, and I think most of it actually just completely misses the point. The Sabbath is, is the only ten, of the Ten Commandments that Jesus doesn't directly repeat. So I don't think that the, the idea of Sabbath is a binding command for Christians in the same way that do not murder is still something we should live our lives by. However, whether or not it's binding for Christians is kind of beside the point. The principle of Sabbath is actually wisdom. The idea of Sabbath is, as we just saw, not tied to the idea of the Jewish law. The idea of Sabbath is tied into creation. There's something about the rhythm of how God has created the world that fits into the seven days. I just heard recently that there's apparently been a number of cultures that have tried to take the system away from seven days of working and every time it's ended in absolute disaster. There's something built into the rhythm of how things work. There's a lot of things that are not legally binding for us as Christians, but remain good wisdom. You can pretend like the law of gravity is not a thing, but sooner or later you're gonna find out how it works. And in the same way, if we work all the time and don't have some form of Sabbath, we're gonna find out the hard way. Now we're of course under grace, not under the law, but even under grace, certain things still apply. You still reap what you sow, and you still become less human when you don't rest. We don't need to be Jewish to live out rhythms of rest. Having that inner peace that I talked about earlier is really important, but we also need the kind of lives that produce rest and life. It's not that long ago that in our culture, the idea of doing things differently on a Sunday was still quite predominant. I used to, you know, it used to be hard to find a shop open on a Sunday. It used, do you remember those days? <laughs> it used to be hard to do anything on a Sunday because everything was closed. And when I, when I grew up, my, my, I grew up in a Christian family and my parents often would say, no, we're not shopping on a Sunday. Now, as a kid, I was always like, why? That was always just a pain whenever I wanted something from the shop. So I'd be like, what do you mean you're not shopping on a Sunday? It felt like an inconvenience rather than connecting it to a bigger why. Now, some of the stuff that happened in the past around Sundays and how that was managed became religion. It became something that was dead. And again, the Sabbath was created for man, not, the, not man for the Sabbath. It's what Jesus would say to it. When you heard of people literally tying up swings on Sundays, so the kids couldn't play, things had gone a little bit far. That's where it becomes dead religion. But I can't imagine Jesus uh, kind of uh, being happy with that. But having said that, as our culture shifts away from Christianity, we do need to think through what a spiritual life actually needs to look like. Now, as a family, we've been playing with this idea of Sabbath uh, for a few years. Since we've had kids, we've always had a, a kind of very protective Saturday. Saturday's been a day where we've kind of protected what we do. However, it was during the pandemic that pushed us into really exploring this in a little bit more depth. If we're honest, it was probably driven by anxiety, pressure, and a ridiculous workload. When you're simply too busy, you have to prioritize things. Back in uh, March 2020, when the pandemic hit, uh, suddenly both Joe and I, with big jobs, find ourselves both completely flat out. 
Jo, of course, was working in the NHS and she got called back onto the front line of COVID, working in ICU, uh, wearing the full PPE every day. And she would come home from these exhausting long shifts. And then she had, you know, because remember the early fear about the pandemic and it was, she had to get changed at the door and then get straight into the shower. And like, it was like, almost like, just burn your clothes on the way in. It, it was like, <laughs> but it was like it was long shifts and she's like working every hour that she can. And then I was working for St. Mungo's, a, a, a large church. And, and when everything went online, it was like, right, Neil, how do we get everything online? And I was like, uh, okay, let's figure it out. A team of 40 musicians trying to create online recordings for worship, like remotely with everyone recording separate things and stitching it together and creating video production, working with my team of, um, I had a team of like four people and we're trying to communicate separately in our own houses and then the internet would go down and things would break and let's just say it was a stressful time. And between the two of us, we also still had two young girls who now we love them dearly, but they were spending every waking moment with us. It was exhausting and it was stressful. But birthed out of that, we realized if we don't protect a day a week, this is gonna be bad for us. This is unhealthy. We need to do something. So we realized we're gonna, we, we attempt to try and take a 24 hour period of rest, a disconnection from work, a time of family, fun, and switching off. Without that circuit break, we were going to break ourselves. So since then, we've kind of worked on this idea and we, we now, we try to finish all of our work on a Friday afternoon. And, um, and then the idea is from like Friday evening all the way through to Saturday evening is no work, no emails, no, no uh, talk about work, no planning for work. And our girls now have dubbed our Saturdays Family Fun Day, which I quite like. It's a bit more catchy than Sabbath, isn't it? It's a time to be present and do things that bring us joy. To call it a Sabbath actually sometimes feels a bit pretentious. Uh, in essence, we're just, but that's kind of what we're aiming at. And we don't live it perfectly. It's, sometimes it is just a bit more like our culture's day off. That's kind of the way it sometimes turns out. But we try to make it something that's more than that. A space in the week, a time of worship and delight. Now we all look forward to that day. We're like, oh great, I can't wait till we get to, to Saturday. It's gonna be a great time together. So we're still figuring this rhythm out and I suspect we'll be experimenting and changing things up. I would call it Sabbath-ish. But what does it mean for you today? Do you need to do the same as us? Well, of course not. But I think that the idea of rest brings up some really important things about how we organize our calendar. I would strongly encourage each of us to think about how we have a weekly rhythm of rest a protected time, a set apart time, uh, holy, if you like. A time not just avoiding work, but to prioritize God and the relationships in your life, to, 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 to really enjoy all the things that God has given you, to celebrate. And it's gonna mean making intentional decisions. What will you do and what will you not do? You know, we, we often rush around on a Friday afternoon now to try and tidy the house. And it's always chaos on a Friday afternoon because it's like we're rushing around like trying to, and it's like in some ways we're busier now on a Friday because we're trying to get everything done so that on Saturday we're not sitting in a messy house going, Ugh, I can cope with that, Joe can't cope with that. So you have to make changes to the things you do in order to, to do something like this. For, so often uh, people, Sundays work well for people uh, we come here and we worship together as a church. We, we have our focus on God. We learn from the Bible. We, we spend time in Christian community. And then maybe we go home and we have a lunch with someone or we go for a walk. And So Sundays can work well. It doesn't work well for us because Sundays also work. But the principle of Sabbath is a great thing. You may not manage a full 24-hour period in your life. It's not a legalistic thing. But I would still encourage you to find time in your weekly rhythm. It may mean doing it on different days and different weeks, but it's designed to help you thrive. It's blessed by God to bring you life. 
This isn't about something to trip over religiously. It's something that God's designed to help you be the best you. It's about reorientating our lives around God on a weekly basis. And the good thing about doing it weekly is it just resets us every week. Whatever week you have, you have we all know it, you have good weeks and you have bad weeks and you have disaster weeks. But to have a reset every week, God, you're good. Look at all the good things you provided in my life. Let's, let's be ready for the next week ahead. And I want to just briefly just tell us three things that, help, that Sabbath helps us to do. And they all start with R, so you'll be very happy. It helps us reorientate. Stopping for a day is, is one of those great reminders that we're not in control. The idea of actually stopping all the normal stuff reminds us that we're not actually in control. You stop your work and the universe continues to go on just fine without you. You avoid social media and nobody dies. You don't check your emails and it's fine, they're still waiting for you the next day. We're not that important. We're not the savior. And it's about trusting. Sometimes Sabbath is about trusting God for the needs of others around us. It's not all on us. We need to trust God that he can get us where he wants us to get us in life without us having to force it to happen. It's also a day to just reorientate ourselves around what's actually the most important things in my life. Relationships with God and and, and those close to us. So it helps us reorientate. Secondly, it helps us recharge. A, A day of rest, worship and delight is deeply good for your soul. We rediscover reserves of hope, reserves of strength, love, and peace. We shake off the hurts of the weak, the things people have said. We let our anxiety settle, and we reconnect with the best version of ourselves. An emotionally healthy person is simply a more loving person. And finally, resist. All around us, we're being marketed to all the time. I don't know if you realize that, but we're being marketed to all the time. And the idea behind marketing is actually to create a desire in you for something. So the marketing around us in our culture is trying to make us want more of whatever it might be. To stop is to resist the desires of the world. It's to stop the wanting, the desiring, the craving. And that is why some people don't shop on their Sabbath, is to resist this consumeristic, materialistic, if I just get the next thing, then this is what I'm going to get. Now, this is a bit of an aside, but if the whole world actually stopped for a day each week, what positive impact do you think that'd have on the planet? It would be the most simple thing, wouldn't it? to stop producing, to stop uh, consuming, to stop all of that for a day a week. A day to enjoy rather than to produce. And the other thing is that when we stop, we also resist the spiritual forces that stand against us. If the devil can't get us to, to stop doing good, then he'll get us to overdo it. It was Corrie Ten Boom that said, if the devil cannot make us bad, he will make us busy. Rest and slowing down actually is resistance. You're resisting the spiritual forces at work. To stop, to rest, to worship is to delight and to resist. And it's often the way we show that we really trust God. So there's our three things for um, why the Sabbath can be a helpful idea. To reorientate, to recharge, and to resist. So coming back just briefly as we conclude, just to looking at this idea of making room for God. Rest, I believe, is a huge part of a life that has space and room for God. Now, slowing down, as we talked about last week, is a, is a vital component. But as well as slowing, sometimes we just need to stop. If God needed to rest, then so do you. But the biblical idea of rest is more than a day off. 
is a rhythm of reset, a reorientating our lives, of worship and delight. And the truth is, if you have never done this before and you decide for the first time you're going to start to do something, set a day aside, then you may discover that it feels pretty awkward at first. All the feelings, the negative emotions, tend to come to the surface whenever you stop. All the things you're worrying about, all the things that are on your brain, all of those things come to the surface. So don't be surprised if you try it and then you go, oh, this feels awful. Because it's only when we stop that the things within our souls actually bubble to the surface. That's normal. But in it is an invitation to realign our identity. Don't give up if you try it and it doesn't work at first. Keep going. In a restless and anxious society, there's an invitation to rest. To know the inner peace that Jesus offers us, but also to reorganize our lives to have rest. If you want to make room for God, then rest is an important ingredient. And the funny thing about creating a life of rest is it doesn't happen without work. I'm just going to finish with the the words here from Hebrews 4 verse 11, which says, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. Make every effort to enter rest that rest. Let me pray for us. And as I do, if the band want to come, come back up. Lord, I I thank you that you uh, give us a pattern of rest. And in a world that doesn't stop for anything, God, I pray that you'd help us to be people of rest. To know the inner calm, the peace that comes from our security in you, but also to be people who reorganize our lives to prioritize you and to find rest in the midst of our season, in our time. And God, I pray that we would become a radical people who resist the desires of the world and the plans of the enemy through rest. Amen. Well, it's been great to have you with us. Um, We hope that you have benefited from this teaching and we pray that the Spirit is at work in your life to help you follow Jesus this week. Be blessed and we hope to see you soon. Bye.